Good evening, everyone. We're going to go ahead and call to order the September 12th meeting of the Capitola City Council. Can I have a roll call, please? Yes. Vice Mayor Brooks. Here. Council Member Morgan. Here. And Mayor Brown. Here. Thank you. And we will note, um, for those who are wondering, that Council Member Peterson and Council Member Clark are uh, absent this evening. We will move on now to our Pledge of Allegiance. Do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda this evening? Staff has no changes to the agenda this evening. Okay. With that, we're going to move on to our presentations. And our first presentation is exciting. It's a mayor's proclamation recognizing the 100th anniversary of the construction of the Venetian Court, which is an exciting uh, milestone. It is older than the city is itself. The city is only 75 years, so this is really exciting. Um, and I'll share some of the information. Uh, whereas envisioned as the second Venice, the Venetian court residences typify a seaside resort adjoining the golden sands and gem blue seas, relishing the songs of waves and salty air. The property was purchased uh, upon which the Venetian courts, courts stand in 1919 and filed the subdivision in 1924. The Venetian court includes private residences and a hotel and has been a landmark in Capitola since its inception and in 1987, the unique history and design of the Venetian court was recognized as a historic district on the National Register of Historic Places. While the famous, vivid, multicolored exteriors were not part of the original architectural design, the Butcher family was inspired to paint their unit pink in the early 1960s after seeing colorfully painted houses during a European trip, and the neighbors soon followed suit. Whereas, to this day, the Venetian court owners diligently maintain the historical character, safety, and security and structural integrity of their homes, walks and seawall through both winter storms and summer crowds so that visitors to Capitola Beach can continue to appreciate the Venetian court for the next hundred years. Now, therefore, I, Kristen Brown, mayor of the city of Capitola, do hereby proclaim 2024 as the 100th anniversary of the construction of the Capitola Venetian court and commend its iconic seaside beauty. Very exciting. I think that deserves a round of applause. Do we have someone here to receive the proclamation? All right, come on up. Well, thank you to the entire council for this recognition um, of the Venetians on its 100th anniversary. I'm, my name is Mike Gardner. I'm fortunate that we're one of the families that is a current homeowner there. And I'm happy and honored, of course, to be the person accepting the proclamation, but I do need to recognize a few groups of people who've been instrumental in the, in the Venetians over their lifetime. You've alluded to some of them already. Of course, the first the visionaries more than 100 years ago uh, who saw the value of a project like this, you know, to complement a charming seaside village and beach, and then to see that project to its fruition. Uh, the homeowners and the city officials over the decades who have protected and supported the Venetians to make sure that that magic is kept alive. Uh, of course, the thousands and thousands of visitors who have come and stayed, and, and not just stayed, but used the Venetian as a jumping off point to dis discover and explore all the great things about the beach and the village and the wonderful people and the surrounding area. Uh, in fact, that's how it started for our family. Um, almost 50 years ago when my parents first brought me and my siblings down and we stayed for a weekend the first couple of years in the Venetian and that became a week and then two weeks and then a month. And then eventually one of the units came up for sale and my mom was lucky enough to be able to buy that. And we've enjoyed it, our, our family, ever since, but we've also really enjoyed giving other families the opportunity to discover and enjoy and fall in love with Capitola and the Venetians the same way we have. 
Uh, I should probably recognize a few thousand photographers. I'm under the impression there's been a few photos taken of, the, of these places over the years, and I'm sure that has not hurt its reputation. Um, and last but not least, the current homeowners association and all the property owners. Um, we, of course, are honored and very proud to be just the current caretakers of such an iconic symbol of Capitola. And as you alluded to, doing everything we can to make sure that they're around for many future generations. So thank you again for this proclamation for the Venetians on its 100th anniversary. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know pretty much any time I talk to someone from out of town and tell them that I live in Capitola, they almost always tell me, oh, with the colorful houses? I go, yes, the place with the colorful houses. And it's the Venetians they're referring to every time. Sure. That'll be good timing. I'm Deborah Osterberg, the museum curator here in Capitola. And I'd like to just mention that I've been doing a rotating exhibits about the Venetian court's history at the Capitola Library. There's one up there right now uh, about um, a gentleman who wrote a book while uh, living there. Uh, so the other thing, too, is that we have a, an exhibit about the Venetian court in the Capitola Mall right now as well, and, of course, also in the museum. So I just wanted to let you know. And one other thing that's kind of uh, pertinent to this room is the other day I had a couple of folks, um, um, Mr. S uh, Silva and his wife came out from the Central Valley, uh, the, uh, the gentleman's uncle was Mr. John Kerr, who did the painting behind you and this painting over here. And so the family got pictures, you know, with the, the painting. So that was really cool. And they also told the rest of their relatives to watch these city council meetings so they could also see the paintings of their family. Oh That's exciting. Well, Deborah, you'll have to find a way to connect me with uh, Mr. Kerr because rumor has it that one of these paintings came out of my grandparent, great-grandparents' coffee shop in Capitola Village back in the 60s, and that oh. the owner or the, the person who painted it gave it to my great-grandparents and it ended up here in City Hall. So I would love to find out which one it is and if that's actually true or if it's just family folklore. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, we're going to move on to presentations uh, 3B, uh, introduction to police officer Eric Estrada. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Um, I'm here this evening to introduce our newest member of the police department. Um, we, I have here Eric Estrada. Um, Eric uh, is uh, just recently got hired with us. He's currently on training with Corporal uh, Vas uh, Vasquez back here. Um, Eric uh, is uh, married and he has five kids. He lives here in Santa Cruz County. Um, he enjoys spending time with his family. Um, he, he enjoys uh, watching sports, reading, um, playing guitar, and he's uh, also very avid in, in the gym. Um, some of the things, his previous experiences include being a personal trainer, a bus driver for the Metro, and then more, more recently he worked for the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department as a correctional officer. And so he's worked in the jail for the last couple of years and is now making the transition out on the street. Um, he's picked the Capitol Police Department, so we're happy to have him. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll leave it to, to Eric, but we're really happy to have him on board. And that brings us up to, again, to full staffing. So we're really excited about that. Great. Uh, Eric. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. I just want to say thank you for uh, coming here today. I want to say thank you for allowing me to be a part of this city. Um, you know, like the chief said, I, I drove the bus for almost eight years. So I got to know the city very well and the people in it. So when I saw this opportunity to come and work here, I mean, it was very easy choice for me. I'm big on family values, and that's why I chose it, because that's exactly what this city and this police department feels like. So I really look forward to uh, seeing all of you out there and everybody here as well. Uh, so if you see me, please say hello. Um, I really want to get to know everybody around here. So again, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome. We're excited to have you with us. Okay, we're going to go to item four, additional materials. It uh, looks like we have more correspondence that was received. Yes, thank you, uh, Mayor. So, yes, we had um, correspondence received regarding item 7C, two for item 7D, and another for 8B. Thank you. Thank also, you. all presentations this evening were uploaded and are included in the agenda packet online. Great, thank you. 
Uh, we will now move on to oral communications from members of the public. This is time for members of the public to address the council on any item that is on our consent agenda this evening or not on our agenda at all this evening. And if you would like to speak, please uh, approach the podium, state your name if you'd like it included in the minutes, and welcome. So, hello, my name is Charlotte Ling, and I'm here as a concerned citizen about Hill Street, especially about the park on the road next to the sports club. The road is going up, it's bending to the right, a lot of cars are feeding into the bike lane. The white line has almost disappeared, and maybe, put, and maybe we need permanent change there, I want to keep the pedestrians and the, pedestrians and the cyclists safe. I have seen children going downhill. I'm not kidding. Yes, if you don't mind just moving the microphone closer. Oh, sorry. So we can hear you. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Okay. I've seen the children going downhill on the wrong side of the road with their e-bike or with their regular bike. And suppose that a car would have been coming. You know, somebody is going to lose them, lose his life. So I really would like to see cones there so that you know, that everybody is safe and that the cars won't go into that area where the bike should should be. And then, the, since the, the white line is all gone on Hill Street, make it all the way up because, you know, we have to walk on the street and still people park in the in the lane, in, in the bike lane. They park there. So that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm getting better in this, you know. <laughs> Thank you so much for your comments. Hi, welcome. Hi. My name is Goran Klovich. I'm a Schweizer Army veteran. That means Swiss Army veteran. Yesterday, I was honored to participate in a memorial for 9-11 victims in Aptos with uh, first responders and uh, police uh, deputies there. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, maybe that uh, maybe not everybody is aware uh, about that, or maybe they are. What happened on 9/11 back in, in uh, 2001? 4,000 people uh, around uh, lost their lives in New York when uh, uh, airplanes hit targets, uh, which were kidnapped by Al Qaeda terrorist group. Uh, that's all I want to say. And uh, I oh uh, something else. I don't think it's a good idea uh, that there are efforts to legalize marijuana. Thank you very much for listening. Goodbye. Thank you, Garin. Hi, welcome. Uh, vaccines for health or profit compiled by Brandy Vaughn, learntherest.org. And here's another book on vaccines. The Unfortunate Truth About Vaccines, Exposing the Vaccine Orthodoxy by Leon Cameron. You know, in a democracy, we're supposed to be able to critique, hear different points of view, different sources of information, challenge, question authority. But with this issue of vaccines, it's like such censorship, and a little more on censorship from the book, The Unfortunate Truth About Vaccines. Here's some unfortunate truth. The following chart by Learn the Risk, that's in this book I held up, reflects the explosion in mandated vaccines over approximately the past 50 years. There has been more than a 14-fold increase in the number of vaccines injected into children today compared to 1962. All of these vaccines contain a multitude of toxins including aluminum, mercury, and formaldehyde, which have overloaded children to such an extent that it has caused detrimental consequences based on numerous scientific studies linking vaccines to autism, autoimmune disease, allergies, asthma, seizures, brain damage, miscarriages, infant death syndrome, SIDS, and more. 
Unfortunately, the medical establishment and the mainstream media backed by the pharmaceutical industry have conveniently avoided any serious discussion of the research that shows the downside of vaccinations. What we are left with is the failure of the U.S. government and related institutions to protect children who are the most vulnerable recipients of these vaccines. This is a book censored uh, by Bookshop Santa Cruz, who would not have the author, local author, speak. And there is a protest of the censorship and banned books when they say, read banned books. This is one of the ones that's banned. It's in front of Bookshop Santa Cruz on Pacific Sunday, one to three o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments this evening? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the council and we will go to staff and city council comments. We'll start with staff. Any comments this evening? I don't think I have any. Okay. Maybe something will come to mind. <laughs> well, no pressure. It's not yeah. required. Um, <laughs> uh, council comments. Yeah, I have a comment. I just want uh, to remind everybody that this weekend is the um, annual Art and Wine Festival put on by the Chamber of Commerce. Um, so it'll be Saturday and Sunday. Saturday, it's 10 to, s 10 to 6. Sunday, it's 10 to 5. Um, I think they are still looking for some volunteers. So if anybody is interested, I would get um, in touch with the chambers. I think checking IDs and pouring or bottle sales. So come on out and have fun. Um, tomorrow is our last um, food truck Friday at Monterey Park. So it starts at 4 and now I think 8 o'clock, usually 7, 7.30, 8 o'clock. Um, so, uh, 7, 7.30, that was close. Um, so tomorrow's the last one. I look forward to seeing all of you there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just have two quick comments. Uh, the first is I had the opportunity last week to go visit um, some of the participants of our after school program our rec, through our rec department. Um, and that was really excited. I was like, exciting. I was talking to um, the participants about our Mayor for a Day essay contest, which that's still open, right? It's not hasn't closed yet. Not yet. Great. Um, so students who are interested in participating in the essay contest can tell us about what they would do if they were mayor for the city. And uh, the winner of the essay contest gets to come up here and I will vacate my seat and they will be uh, mayor and get to read their essay to us. So uh, I encourage if you have any students um, in, in your life to encourage them to participate. Uh, the students that I spoke with had some really exciting ideas for our city, mostly based around um, in getting an in and out and how long school days should be, but also they had actually, <laughs> they also had some really good ideas though. Um, they mentioned that we should have sidewalks throughout our entire city and that we should have more beach cleanups. And I thought that those were really smart ideas that we should consider as a city. Uh, the other thing I want to share is that on September 25th, the long awaited grand opening of the wharf, uh, we're really excited. There's going to be speeches and food and fun and celebration, and it has been a long time coming since we have all been able to come together as a community on our beloved Capitola Wharf, and so I hope to see you all there. It starts at 2 p.m. on September 25th. See you there. Okay. Uh, with that, we will move on to our consent agenda. Uh, is there any member of the council that would like to move an item from consent? Hearing none, we'll entertain a motion. I'll move the consent agenda item 7A through D. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We will move on now to item 8A, Capitola Wharf Long-Term use, long Use and Development Plan. Speaking of the wharf. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, Council. Um, before you tonight, I'm going to be presenting the Capitola Wharf Long-Term Plan contract. Here we are. Um, next slide, please. 
So our recommended action tonight is to authorize the city manager to execute an agreement with Fuse Architecture for outreach, planning, and design services for the long-term use and development plan for the Capitola Wharf in the amount not to exceed $75,000, subject to city attorney review and approval. Next slide. So background, I think we're all very familiar with the background to the wharf. It's been a major focus for our city over the last um, three years. In 2022, we started, we initiated the widening and replacing of the pilings, uh, the deck and adding restroom facilities, that project for resiliency. And unfortunately, in December of 2023, um, due to a large, the storm damage, uh, additional damage was made to the wharf mid-construction which um, caused us to have to remove the buildings on site. Um, and then, as just announced on September 25th, we're going to be having a celebration on the wharf, the reopening. Um, the temporary use plan is now in effect and that um, boat and bait is operating on the wharf currently. And we've also, uh, there's two um, special events. One is on September 25th, the grand reopening, and then there's also a concert and I think food trucks planned for October 6th. Um, when we brought the temporary use plan to city council earlier in the year, uh, we were directed, let's, let's plan for 2024 and we'll uh, revisit this early in 2025 to figure out what we're going to do for the temporary plan in 2025. So that's where we are today. Um, in terms of the the contract that you'll be reviewing tonight, the RFP was issued in May of 2024. The selected consultant was Fuse Architecture, and they're um, partnering with Moffat Nickel, who have worked on the work, wharf before. Um, they have a great understanding of the structural needs for the wharf and any future development there. And then Fuse Architecture is a great architecture group uh, that's locally based in Capitola. Um, the scope of the contract is outreach, planning, and design for future uses and structures on the wharf. Next slide, please. Um, so the steps in this, um, a little bit later, Chloe will be presenting the strategic um, plan. And during the strategic plan effort, which is separate from this contract, there, we're going to have specific questions to the public about the long-term use and structures on the wharf. So. Rather than um, just tire out our community with too many surveys, we're blending that effort to get feedback, especially um, this, they're, they're really, within the strategic plan, they're um, very talented in getting feedback, and we thought, let's keep it to one survey. So um, next. And then within the Capitola Wharf long-term plan, we'll have, um, so we'll get that initial feedback, we'll give it to Fuse. Um, and then from there, they'll put together an alternative analysis report, and that will come to the city council in February. Then we'll have, we'll give that to the um, city council to provide feedback if they want any changes to the, the options that FUSE brings forward. Um, based on that, if, if okayed by the city council, we'll put it out to public outreach on the alternatives, and then we'll return to the city council in April to hear what the outcome of the public outreach was and get direction in that third step from city council on which item, and there'll be a recommendation, um, should be the final long-term development plan. So then they'll, from April until June, they'll, they'll work out the final details of that final long-term development plan and we'll um, present that to you in June, early summer of next year. Um, so five alternatives uh, within the contract, there's, a requirement that their fuse is going to put together five alternatives. The first is for open space. Uh, the second is the current use option with having uh, boat and bait or um, and uh, to have fishing out on the wharf in structures as well as the possibility of temporary events. Um, the third option would be mobile structures. The fourth is small structures, and then the fifth is permanent larger structures. Um, within each alternative, FUSE is going to put together a site plan and renderings, cost estimates, and then an overview of what the permitting is. I do have some slides I'm going to show you next, and I just want to um, make it clear that these are not specific proposals. These are examples to really show you um, the types of structures we're going to be asking FUSE to consider when they put together these renderings. But these are examples from other places. They will not be reproposed. Um, They'll have an, um, authentic designs that come forward out of this proposal 
that are more reflective of Capitola. So um, it's just a, a helpful way to understand what the five alternatives are. So I'll quickly go through these. The first is an open space proposal, and this, it's the project that went before Planning Commission and was approved. Um, just the open space of the wharf with benches and tables, bathroom out there, but not much else going on. So next. Uh, next is the current use option where we have fishing and events out on the wharf. Third is mobile structure option, um, and that's just structures that can be moved on and off the wharf. So if there was a storm, they could be moved off or... Um, Next is the small structures, um, small all-weather structure option. And those are um, just smaller structures, a little still in the less expensive side, but they would not be able to be wheeled off the wharf if there was an event. Next. And lastly, permanent structure option. Um, and this is examples of what was there before and just structures on other wharfs that are permanent. Um, so public outreach, there's quite a bit of public outreach. So first, there'll be the within the strategic planning, the initial outreach to um, get opinions and uh, of what people would like to see or how they'd like to use the wharf in the future. We'll have within this contract a community meetings, one in person and one virtual once there's the five options are designed. And then a public survey to get feedback on the five alternatives, and we'll make sure to have that survey available for at least three weeks. Um, council presentations, I've mentioned this, but we'll have the first presentation in February of 2025, so you can see what FUSE is put together in terms of alternatives. And then in, um, if, if you give your blessing for us to put that out for public review, we'll then come back in April to present the findings of the public outreach, and then in June, um, and at that April meeting, we'll be looking for direction on, on choosing the final option. And then in June, we'll present that final long-term plan. So with that, I am available for questions. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks, Katie. Um, so when I'm looking over this, uh, this particular contract, I'm thinking about like council input. And, and so in February, I'm just wondering, um, before it comes to us, when each of those projects are budgeted, I'm just thinking about budget feasibility and how that's going to tie into what's presented to us for our budget goal, you know, when we set our goals. So I'm just wondering if those are conversations you're going to have with FUSE in terms of, like, realistic um, expectations, you know, things that we can really do when all five projects are presented. Because um, I could just imagine something that costs $30 million could cross, cross the dais. So I'm just curious about... Curious about what staff is doing to work with views and in, in um, aligning that for us. Yeah, you know, um, in our conversations with views, um, feasibility is one of the number one items. So within these options, uh, why originally when we were brainstorming how to go about this, we thought we'd go out to the public first for ideas, um, for all ideas and. Um, we thought it would be more useful to put concepts together that are feasible just so that there is a realistic expectation that can be met within our um, budget. But of course, within the five alternatives, you have extremely feasible options of open space <laughs> to if it were the permanent structures, that would take a long time for us to, you know, compile all the financing for those projects. It would, the um, finished, completed project would take longer than, say, the mobile but um, that is a focus that we have been having discussions with views about, that each option, whatever we put out there within the five options, must be feasible for the city. And, and so my second part of it is about the community meetings. There was two. And we currently have multiple commissions, you know, our finance advisory committee, all the way to our chief's council, to our, um, our environmental commission, arts and cultural um, I, I'm not seeing any kind of collaborative effort to reach out to all those groups. All those groups have business owners and community members, and we work really hard on appointing folks in the community um, across the, the city. Um, I'd really like to see all of those groups tapped separately than just a community meeting, um, because not every, it, 
not everyone can always make those or uh, get access to the survey. Even our BIA, you know, I, not necessarily a group we govern, but just outreach to these groups and our commissions, our planning commission, to really set some time for input and really build that into um, the outcomes that, are, that come before us in February. So I'd like, I'd like to see that really um, come back to us in February, that they've all been, you know, talked to and they've all had an opportunity to, to give comment. So um, before February or once the five options are put together? So if during the back, yeah, if we look back, it looks like um, one more slide back. It just shows community meetings, one in person and one virtual and a survey. In addition to that, I'd really like to see all of our commissions and the BIA tapped for input um, because those those are representatives who have different hats on. So the environmental commission is going to look at it with a different lens rather than our art and cultural commission, rather than our chief's council. They're all going to look at the this with their hats on representing those groups. And I think it's really important for everyone to have that, um, be given that opportunity. Um, just to be clear, so the public outreach would happen after the February meeting. So once you've um, told us that you can move forward with these five alternatives, so as long as if that could happen during the public outreach period, that's as as definitely yeah, doable. Yeah, they're all, they all okay. have an opportunity. Thank you. Uh, okay, with that, we will bring this to public comment. If there's any member of the public that would like to address the council on this item, now would be the time. Welcome back. Thank you. I like the idea of the open space <laughs> because given the storms and the way the wharf has had to be repaired many times, when you say the option for permanent building or permanent businesses on there, I'm thinking this area doesn't lend itself to permanent. <laughs> In fact, what's going on in the world near nuclear catastrophe, who knows what's permanent, but the open space is the one that makes most sense. And I also think of the Aptos Wharf that was removed after all the destruction. You can just see the cement ship structure remains. So that seems to make most sense to me. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to council uh, for discussion. Any discussion or comments? Okay. Any discussion or comments? No, I just think that, or yes, and um, I think the five areas of focus make sense that it kind of incorporates everything, and so I'm appreciative of views bringing that forward um, based off of kind of the input we got from the short-term um, process. Um, and I just look forward to seeing what the community survey comes back with. So I'm happy to make um, a motion to authorize the city manager to execute an agreement with FUSE for outreach planning and design services for the long-term use and development plan for the Capitola Wharf and amount not to exceed 75,000 subject to city attorney review and approval. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second for the sake of discussion. Um, once we get to the public participation Point, uh, plan. I think to uh, Vice Mayor Brooks' point, in addition to, uh, I know it's a lot of different stakeholders and whatnot, but I think it would also be really important that there be um, individual discussions with the most kind of intensive uh, stakeholders on the wharf, and that would be uh, the boat and bait folks and the former wharf house restaurant owner. I think those two should have one-on-one -on -one interviews to discuss their thoughts about the future of the wharf. Thank you. Huh? The Venetian? Yeah. Yeah. The Venetian HOA, I think, would be a good one, too. All right. Is that it? Yep. Okay. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you so much. We are moving on now to item 8B, McGregor Asphalt Pump Track. 
Good evening, Mayor and Council. We have a fun one for you today. <laughs> <laughs> All good news. <laughs> All right, so we are here to talk about uh, that pump track at McGregor Park. As you may recall, this was constructed in 2016, um, and we discovered some uh, contamination there, specifically arsenic. So the whole thing got all the dirt ripped up, uh, clean dirt put in, put a cap in there, and then we built on top of it. So we are all square now with the county, and we are completely prepared to do uh, additional improvements to the site. Next slide. Um, so this was day one of the pump track. Everyone loved it. There were children. It was great. Next slide. Um, it is very hard to maintain, and this is any kind of earthen pump track anywhere where it rains because it retains water. The Just even with the best drainage, you get erosion of this sort. So we do close it periodically due to that. Next slide. Luckily, we have a very active pump track community here. I know they were here during budget time. Uh, last go around and they did this um, cleanup of the pump track last spring. Next slide. So in the 24-25 budget, you all allocated $30,000 for some pump track refurbishment um, with the intent of staff going out to seek additional funding to supplement the budget of that project. Um, the intention of that project was to upgrade the earthen track to an asphalt track. It obviously reduces maintenance because it doesn't have erosion anymore more longevity, and then also provides an enhanced writing experience. Most of the new pump tracks in the area, including the one out at Pinto Lake in Watsonville, is also an asphalt pump track. Next slide. Um, these are examples of the one in Pinto Lakes there on the left. This is an example, I believe, on the East Coast, but these are what they look like. So they're not the prettiest facilities, but they are a lot of fun. Next slide. Um, so we put out an RFP for this project in July 2024, and while we did get some interest from other um, contractors, we did only get one formal response from Amer Action Sports Construction, and they're the ones who did the uh, original pump track that we have out there at McGregor and also many of the pump tracks around the state and around the country. Um, they are under American Ramp Company, which is the proposed um, who the contract would be with, but it, it is the same people as Action Sports Construction. So they have extensive experience in developing these types of tracks, uh, so we're very confident in their abilities. Next slide. Um, so this was the graphic that was included in their proposal. Uh, the green is not turf, it's just to delineate where it is not asphalt. So you have your track, you have your areas that are kind of graded off track, um, that make it more fun to ride. And then there on the far right side where you see kind of a black area is a proposed wall ride. Next slide. Uh, it's a 90 degree prefab wall ride. You get to do that on it and have the ability to put any kind of um, uh, branding that is also available for this uh, type of facility. Next slide, please. Um, so staff did go out seeking uh, funding for this project, and the Monty Foundation agreed to a $90,000 donation for this project, which is incredibly exciting. Just requesting a 10-year recognition uh, for this donation, um, which could go on that wall right in the last slide, or could go an additional signage on the track, uh, TBD. Next slide. Um, so these kind of projects have a relatively quick turnaround. Obviously, we're getting towards fall, so it may rain, so no promises. But the design phase is relatively quick, and we really expect this to be completed late this year or early next year. Next slide. Um, so the total project budget with the allocation in the budget plus the donation is $125 off of uh, what we uh, have budgeted for this project, which we will easily be able to find. <laughs> next slide. So with that, the recommended action is on the screen, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Questions? Thank you, Jessica. I wish I knew how to do that. Um, <laughs> my two questions. Um, we had a wonderful nonprofit come by um, to offer their services to help clean it during the, when it was all damaged. Um, they're also just, they just know about all the other pump trucks or, yeah, or tracks that were created even locally. And I'm curious if you've reached out to them just on input of what they liked in the other one versus what could be, you know, maybe we can offer something different above and beyond. Is that really cool? 
something. Have you done that yet? Or so we have been actively in touch with them since they knew it was budgeted. They were looking for updates of, have you found more money? And luckily we will say, yes, yes, we did. And so we have been talking to them. There is a design phase in this project that includes some outreach to stakeholders. And then my second question, and we also have a dog park over there um, that we heard from the community that dogs don't like to use. Will this some of this fun help with the upgrades of that or new turf for taking away tan bark and putting in something else? No, no unfortunately. Um, I will say that it'll be a whole lot less dusty up there if that bothers some of the dogs, but I would say the intensity of use we expect to be around the same and the noise that you also get from the skate park next door is also is louder than you would get, be getting off an asphalt pump track. Okay, thank you. Those are all my questions. Okay, we'll bring this now to public comments. Any member of the public like to comment on this item? <laughs> this seems like such a hazardous sport. I'm picturing when I came out of my acupuncturist office one day, in comes a mother with her son who'd broken his leg skateboarding on this kind of, I don't know the location, but it seems like this caters to a certain population of young people who like doing this sport. And I don't know what the liability is for the city, but what did you ask something about? It could have been a dog park. I missed hearing that. It seems like there are other park uses that serve more of the public. And I wonder also, what's the comparison of injuries? Skateboarding on dirt compared to cement. It seems to me it'd be more. This just seems so hazardous to me. I look at it and I go, this looks like, you know, a disaster. Um, of, yeah, anyway, it's not something that seems like a good idea for a larger group of members of the community. Thank you. Any further comments? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to council. Questions? Uh, I just have uh, a quick question, I think, to address maybe what other members of the community are wondering as well, which is what is you know, we already have a pump track there. We already have a skate park. We already have a dog park in that same area. It's all, all co-located in that same park. Um, so what does the city uh, liability look like for the, the pump track and the skate park? I'm assuming since they're already there, this is something we've addressed before, but I'm assuming members of the public might be wondering as well. I think we would have some immunities. Um, for anything to happen there. Okay. I mean, I'm assuming it's the same as using any public facility? Yeah, okay. Okay, um, with that, we'll entertain a motion if there's no further comments. I will make the motion to authorize the city manager to execute a professional services agreement with American Ramp Company for McGregor Asphalt Pump Track um, in the amount not to exceed one hundred and twenty thousand and one hundred and twenty-five dollars. Oh, and we are amending the um, fiscal year twenty-four twenty-five budget to accept that very generous ninety thousand dollar donation. I'll second to that, uh, and and a thank you to the Monty Family Foundation for that very generous donation. Um, I will be excited to provide their recognition on the wall. Or sign mm -hmm. it or whatever. Yeah, for sure. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Moving on to our final item, a strategic plan project update. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Give me one moment so that everyone can see the presentation. Okay, like you mentioned, this is going to be a brief strategic plan update. This is an informational item, so there won't be a vote required unless you give significant feedback. 
But this is more just to keep council in the loop as we bring back um, a project that we had paused. So a little bit of background in the fiscal year budget 23-24, so not this past one, uh, you did direct staff to develop five, 10, and 15 year strategic goals. And in that budget allocated $50,000 towards such a project. And in September, wow, a year ago, shocking. In September 2023, uh, Council, you know, we discussed the need for this to be a living document, something flexible, and a, a plan that could be adaptable to the future. And then um, at the end of last year, you approved a $50,000 contract with Barry Dunn after significant analysis of um, proposals and interviewing. Uh, Barry Dunn was selected by yourselves. And early this year, Staff worked with Barry Dunn in bi-weekly meetings. We did all of the internal work um, and we're just about to launch the project to the public, um, I would say in spring, um, after developing a stakeholder list, reviewing interview questions, surveys, that kind of work. But in March, um, it was determined that we should pause the project until this fall. So here we are in fall 2024, just about to get started again. And um, I'm really excited about the next phase. So we're just about to enter into the planned engagement for this project, which will coincide with, very exciting, the Wharf grand opening celebration at the end of this month, like you said, September 25th. The plan is to have uh, some tabling at that event, which introduces the public to this strategic planning project and just get a little bit of feedback in person and also um, introduce the public to some survey questions. Followed by on October 1st, there will be an in-person community forum. We're just about to start promoting that now that council is aware that that will be happening. That'll be in person here at City Hall and will be really a lot of back and forth with the community. Um, council will, is, is also invited to, to listen and hear what the community has to say at that event, really geared towards um, members that want to share what they want to see with Capitola. So it's very exciting, along with online uh, surveys, interviewing stakeholders, which includes all of our board and commissioners, um, which I know is important to council, and also staff. So this is you know, external community members and those that work here for the city. And then something really fun and exciting that I'm going to show you is called Social Pinpoint, which is an online portal, kind of the most modern version of community outreach and like data collection that we've used. So I'm sure you could imagine the city manager is excited about that, and so am I. So let me show you an example. Um, I just want you to know, so these are strategic plans that are in process with Barry Dunn using a, a pinpoint site, but these are not citywide strategic plans. This is a parks district plan, and then I have a library, I believe, as well. So just a brief overview, you can tell these are pictures of that community. These are the community's colors the logo, so it's, the look and feel is going to be Capitola and not generic, so that's great. I think that will garner more response from the public. And it's really about data collection, like I mentioned. So you can click through to the survey, so you can take the survey online. And then also this, oh boy, okay. Oh wait, this one uh, has the board um, ideas. There's a lot of different functionality that we've chosen, but share your ideas. The idea wall is something that we will have. And as you can see, this is real people have left these comments um, per topic that has been selected about what they want to see um, in their town. So this is just an example. I'm happy to report that ours is going to launch next week. So we're going to be able to start collecting um, information from the public really soon, which is great. And then I will go back to my slides. So that's most of the planned engagement. And then council, your specific involvement, other than you know really being welcome to most of, of these opportunities, is um, a full day workshop in mid-November. Thank you for um, being available for that, where we'll begin to really develop the strategic plan with Barry Dunn's expertise. And then early 2025, a review of the draft plan and then final adoption to follow once you've been able to give comments. and. Um, that really brings me to the end here, unless I'm more than happy to answer questions. And if that's the information you need, we'll just get started next week. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe. Um, 
I was wondering if you could send council calendar invites for the meetings before ours in November. Absolutely. Um, so that at least we can get them on our calendar and mm -hmm. then, I mean, we all won't show up to all of them at the same time because that was right. But um, And then in terms of outreach to the community to let them know, I, the website looks amazing. Um, I was just learning about different marketing strategies today. Um, and I was curious about getting it like on KSVW, um, you know, so that folks are aware mm -hmm. I, I, if we're still under budget, if that's something we can do so that people know um, that they can, that we're doing this in the community. Absolutely. I can certainly look into that. Um, do, you know, internal work or before that launch will be, you know, press release about the project, you know, internal and external email, social media in the, the Capitola Wave newsletter. But I love your idea and I can definitely look into that, doing more of an actual an ad. Yeah, and I, and I we stressed last time the importance of having it in um, Spanish mm -hmm. translated, um, but also, you know, not everyone's on. I think the outreach was just really important to us, so um, getting them dropped off or flyers dropped off at different really. apartment complexes in both English and Spanish and mm -hmm. um, and parks and, and all of those types of things, just really trying to get different, um, getting everyone involved is really important to me, so thank you. Um, just to follow up on that, I think KSBW even has a community calendar. Great. That you don't have to pay for an ad. It's just like in their, mm -hmm. I don't know how it works, but it's something to look into. Thank you. Um, one of the things that you showed was, um, I think it was the library district had mm -hmm. like a your budget feature where mm -hmm. it gave people like theoretical dollars that they could put towards certain features that they felt were most important. Are we going to have something like that on ours? Because I like that concept of showing people like we have a limited budget and where would most people put their money if they were the same? Yes. So I, I also liked the idea. Um, in discussing with Barry Dunn, they indicated that that isn't necessarily the best for such a large strategic plan that kind of is for the whole city. It's not just one kind of aspect. However, yeah, that makes sense. there will be um, uh, priorities and so there will be weighing priorities and putting things in order for the public to do. So I do think we will we will learn a lot in that way. But if that's a concern for you, this hasn't been launched yet. And so we could choose that as an option. I think we're limited to how many different kind of interactive, okay. um, I don't want to say things, but yeah. things that we have on the site. So that was what I was told by sure. their team. That makes sense. I, I, I understand completely. Um, so if if not the kind of, you know, your $100 mm -hmm. that you put on here, I did see there was also just like, what are your budget priorities generally? Exactly. And I think that one would be important because yes. I think, you know, it's important to um, kind of side by side, what are people's priorities for the city? And then what are their budget priorities? Because if they're mm -hmm. different, you know, we need to know where, where we should actually be putting money in the future. Because a lot of times items in a strategic plan require budget allocation. Absolutely. Um, okay. And then uh, my last uh, question or comment, I guess, is um, I know that the council members were asked to provide additional uh, input on on additional stakeholders mm -hmm. that might be interviewed, and we were supposed to do that by close of business today, and I sent mine right before the council meeting. Which Thank you. Is technically not close of business. It's technically after close of business, but I hope that they will still be considered. Of course. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, we will take it to public comment. Hello. Hi. <laughs> when you talk about stakeholders, I've been to many meetings. I find often the public doesn't seem to be a stakeholder. <laughs> and they're the major ones, actually, in reality. As I listen to what you said about portals and uh, computer, I'm probably the only one in the room who doesn't have a cell phone and doesn't have a computer. When you talk about community outreach, and I taught elementary school, second and third grade for 30 years, I think of person to person interaction with different activities, parks, projects, learning math, whatever. and all of this more and more to computers is, I think, very destructive of humanity. 
and often we're having all this wireless microwave stuff, and I have um, a trifle that I'll leave you with. It's called Mobile Communications, the clause, cause for the global disappearance of the bees. And as I go about Capitola, the huge cell tower between Bay Porter and Park, and he's always whispering when I'm talking, which I don't consider very uh, polite. Um, I have to avoid going that way because the radiation gives me, I get a terrible headache and, and kind of heart palpitations, which are symptoms. So I'll just read you this, and I wish it were funny, but it's not. For several years, a massive disappearance of bees have been observed worldwide. In Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, for example, about 30% of the bees died during the winter 29-2010. Uh, they call it colony collapse disorder. But none of the factors known to have had any influence here, such as the virulamite, insecticides, fungicides, or lack of food due to changes in the environment, can provide a satisfactory explanation as to the main cause. All of those are causes, too. For the unusually high decline of the honeybee population, no matter how much all of these factors just mentioned do impact the natural life and functioning of bees, the actual reason for the disappearance of the bees is the worldwide proliferation of mobile communications. There's also a document called Bees, Birds, and Mankind Destroying Nature by Electrosmog, translated from the German. It's by Warnke. So I'd like to see strategic plans without cell towers. Thank you. And here, I'll give you that. Yes, you can leave that with our clerk. Thank you. Okay, any further comment on this? Seeing none, we will bring it back to the council for a further discussion and a vote. I don't think it needs a vote, but I do. Oh, yeah, that's right. We don't need a vote. Um, Thank you. But our speaker does raise a good point about ensuring that there's other ways other than online to offer input. Um, so I am sure the experts will um, be able to brainstorm with you and something like that. And we're excited about the in-person community forum on October 1st as well. Yeah. Um, or even just like paper surveys. Paper surveys, absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I was just going to touch on the fact that, yeah, there's the, the September 25th, there will be some outreach and then uh, in-person and then October 1st as well. Um, and then I... I, going off of what you were talking about with the funding, like dollar amount, I feel like that would be a good choice if we're focusing on a specific project. But like in for like the grand scheme of things, just kind of keep it more. I mean, it'll have to be pretty broad for such a large budget. But yeah, um, but um, that looks really cool. The social pinpoint. So thanks for finding that. Okay. Uh, if there's no further discussion, staff has what you need from us on this item. Okay, great. All right, well, that brings us to, wow, under an hour. That's one of the shortest council meetings I think we've had this year. Um, that brings us to the end of our meeting. So we are adjourning to our next regularly scheduled city council meeting on September 26th at 6 p.m. Until then, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Good night.